Here you see before and after photos of patients treated with the Bono Blend technique. Each after photo is six months to one year after the final treatment. Please notice the lack of any scarring or marking following this treatment, even on sensitive facial skin. The telangitron uses two distinct electrical currents introduced into the blood vessel by an ultra-fine needle. Low-level high frequency is used to coagulate the blood vessel by producing a clot in the vessel itself. Low-intensity direct current is used to generate a tiny amount of sodium hydroxide. This results in a small amount of tissue decomposition around the needle. Thus the direct current is used to both enter the lumen of the blood vessel and to release the needle from the coagulated clot. Let's take a look at the basic Bono Blend procedure. Indeed, there are specific variations, but for the most part, the treatment proceeds as follows. You first insert the needle into the blood vessel using direct current only. You then coagulate the vessel with high frequency, and you remove the needle with direct current only. Let's take a closer look at this process. With the DC on, the ultrafine needle glides into the blood vessel. Because of the direct current, there is no need to force the needle into the skin. It just slides in. Once in the blood vessel, you switch on the high frequency to rapidly coagulate the vessel. The direct current is usually left on because the high frequency supersedes the direct current. Within a couple of seconds, you will clearly see the clot form as the vessel blanches. Once maximum coagulation has taken place, the high frequency is switched off, but the direct current remains on. With the direct current on, you hold the needle in position for a moment to allow the needle to loosen from the coagulated clot. With the DC on, you simply withdraw the needle. Note that each insertion and coagulation takes between one and three seconds. Again, there is a great advantage in using the direct current in this way. The tiny amount of sodium hydroxide produced allows the needle to be removed without having the clot stick to the needle. Thus, the clot is left intact and undisturbed. Here you see a common case of telangiectasia on the nose. The actual treatment time was about three minutes. Please note the blanching and a bit of the sodium hydroxide that appears as a white froth. Notice, too, that the needle does not stick to the skin. It simply slides out. In most cases such as this, one treatment should be sufficient to permanently eliminate the telangiectasia. Note that I'm simply tracing down each blood vessel.
Here you see the patient immediately after treatment. The edema and redness usually subsides in about an hour or so. Perhaps the most frequently asked question is, isn't this just another hyfricator type of device? Well, both the telangitron and the hyfricators use a needle and high frequency to coagulate the vessel, but there are significant differences. All hyfricator type devices use high frequency only, no direct current. Here's the problem with such devices. If you insert into the blood vessel and coagulate with the high frequency only, the clot then sticks to the needle itself. Thus, in most instances, the clot is pulled out with the needle, the vessel reopens, and the treatment fails. To alleviate this sticking problem, virtually all hyfricator type devices have you not insert into the vessel, but simply touch the skin. In this way, only epidermis sticks to the needle. However, in order to coagulate the vessel, the high frequency output must be strong enough to penetrate the skin overlying the vessel. In fact, hyfricators use 10 times the current output of the telangitron. This high output damages the dermis, creates large scabs, and thus pitted scars are common with hyfricator type devices. This graph illustrates the incredible high frequency differences between the telangitron and the hyfricator. The vertical scale indicates high frequency output in volts. The horizontal scale shows the actual dial setting on the hyfricator. As you can see, when the hyfricator is switched on and simply left in the zero position, the device is already producing 500 to 1000 volts. By contrast, the telangitron uses only 40 to 60 volts of high frequency. Here's another comparison. The green graph represents the maximum high frequency output of the telangitron. You can see down about 60. The red graph on the right shows the actual minimum high frequency output or the zero setting of the hyfricator. As you can see, it's at least 500 and in most cases more. Here you see a microscopic comparison between a typical hyfricator type needle and the telangitron needle. For the most part, the hyfricator needle is designed to simply touch the skin's surface. The telangitron needle is significantly finer and designed to be inserted into the vessel itself. Here you see typical crusting after a treatment with a hyfricator type device. In most cases, post-treatment crusting with the telangitron is microscopic and barely noticeable. Here you see scar tissue that formed after treatment with a hyfricator type device. Such scars almost never occur with the telangitron. This is a 35-year-old woman with an angioma of about one centimeter in diameter. Treatment time was about a minute and a half. Notice the tiny scar off to the top right of the lesion. We will use this as a locator. Treatment is simple, just coagulate the entire lesion. Because current levels are very low, there is little risk of damaging deeper tissues. Thus, scarring and marking almost never occurs with this type of lesion. This is all that's left of the angioma 30 days after one treatment. Notice our tiny locator scar. A bit of the telangiectasia remained and required a treatment of a few seconds. Here's the area 30 days after the second treatment. Notice our tiny locator scar. Indeed, there was no scarring or marking from treatment with the telangitron. These are common dot-like telangiectasia seen on the face, neck, and body. These are common on the chest and probably result from sun exposure. These lesions look like cayenne pepper and are usually less than half a centimeter in diameter. Treatment is typically 100% successful in all cases. Only one treatment is necessary. 
just coagulate the entire lesion. Post-treatment scarring, marking, or any other problem has not been seen or reported. Here's a patient with only a few telangiectasia on the nose. Even when only a few lesions are present, we have found that the treatment outcome is better if you are conservative. As you will see, I'm treating only two out of four of the closely placed lesions in the corner of the nose. Then I will wait three to four weeks and remove those remaining. In this way, the skin does not become overly inflamed and the treatment holds. Please also notice that even though only a few lesions are removed, the entire area appears clear after the treatment. Indeed, the localized inflammation obliterates all the untreated telangiectasia. Therefore, you must warn the patient that the untreated lesions will reappear and must be treated at another time. The following is an entire treatment sequence, start to finish. Here is patient Tom J with pronounced telangiectasia on the cheeks and nose. Here you see the areas before treatment. We begin our treatment series on the right cheek. Treatment time for this first treatment was 12 minutes for both the nose and right cheek. In all these shots, I have sped up the camera. Notice the blood oozing from the area just treated. This is not a problem. Do not coagulate the area again. Just carefully wipe the area following treatment. And here's the area immediately after treatment. Here's the first treatment on the nose. Notice I'm just tracing along each vessel. One of the advantages of the telangitron is that it is very selective and affects minimal surrounding tissue. Thus, not much inflammation takes place. Consequently, far less angiogenesis and neovascularization is stimulated by this treatment. Notice that I have not treated the entire nose but left many vessels for a later treatment. This first treatment on the left side of the nose took about five minutes. Notice I am not treating contiguous vessels but spacing my work. Again, some blood oozing is normal and is not a problem. And here's the first treatment on the left cheek. Essentially, I'm going after the largest vessels in this initial treatment. The smaller vessels can be treated at the next session in three to four weeks. And here's the area immediately after the first treatment. Here's the left cheek four weeks after the first treatment. Notice the large vessels have been eliminated and again we proceed with the second treatment. And here's the area uh, immediately after treatment. This is crusting five days after treatment. In most cases, crusts are much smaller than these on the face with the Bono Blend technique. Let's take a look at Tom four months after treatment was completed. Three treatments of 20 to 30 minutes each were required, with three to four weeks between each treatment. 
Please notice that no scars or marks resulted from treatment with the telangitron. A patient with an extensive case, such as this, probably has a hereditary predisposition for developing telangiectasia. In fact, Tom said his father has an extensive case, so he was most eager to remove his very noticeable vascular blemishes. When you have a patient that is predisposed to telangiectasia formation, the best you can do is reset the clock, that is, remove those vessels that have formed over the years. In most cases, such as this, you may need to treat the patient once per year for 15 minutes or so to stay ahead of the vessel formation. As you can see, none of the original large blood vessels are left. I think we did uh, quite well on the cheek, and the patient was very pleased with the results. Thank you for watching this video. One final thought. Aging and sun exposure is the primary cause of telangiectasia. Clearly, the aging baby boomer population will want this treatment when they discover the ease, simplicity, and low cost of this treatment.